really great pleasure that you are, are with us here tonight. Not only uh, worked in a range of different countries in Sudan, uh, with the UN, with a number of different agencies and task forces all over the world on this issue. Um, so it's fantastic that you're here. Uh, we welcome you to the McGee campus and we really look forward to what you have to say. So thank you, Helena. Thank you for introducing me and for having us all here. Um, and also indeed for being such great supporters of the Build Peace Conference. Um, the Build Peace Conference started uh, in 2014 for the first time in Boston, and this is actually our fifth year anniversary. So we're very excited uh, to be holding the conference in Belfast and to have the opportunity to also visit here and, uh, and, uh, and have a, a pre-event and a pre-discussion um, of some of the issues that we know will come up um, in the conference on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Um, so Brandon already said a little bit about um, uh, what, I, what I do. Um, so I'm the co-founder, um, along with, uh, with Michaela, who's uh, sitting in the audience, um, and a number of our team members are here as well, of, uh, of Build Up, which is an organization that recognizes and catalyzes better local peace building through innovation. Um, and we do this in a number of different ways. We do it by researching innovative practices for peace building, um, also by applying our learning to projects spanning many different contexts and countries, um, mainly by supporting initiatives that are led by um, other peace builders and also by sharing the knowledge that we gather through, um, through our applications with a community of practice. And that community is pra of practice is very much rooted in the Build Peace Conference that will take place in Belfast. Um, and through our work, uh, we're constantly asking ourselves this question, which is, uh, I guess, the, the core question that, that I was hoping to address um, this evening with you. Um, and I'm going to give you some ideas um, that have come up in conversation uh, in the work that we do. But I also hope that we will have an opportunity to, to get your thoughts on this question and your reflections to some of the things that I say, uh, which I guess is why we were saying it's more provocations rather than answers to this question. So the question we ask ourselves all the time is, what is the relationship between digital technology and peace? Is digital technology creating the conditions for more polarization, for more discord, and eventually for violence? Or is it the opposite? Do digital technologies offer new and exciting ways to connect, to find common ground, and to build peace? My experience in working in different contexts and in speaking to different audiences is that people tend to fall into one of these two camps. They're either very dystopian about what digital technology is doing to us and to our experiences of connection and, uh, and of peace and of conflict, or they're very utopian about the possibilities that technology, digital technology brings to connect us better. Um, and I'm not sure where I stand anymore. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that I, I ever knew where I stood, and, and I think maybe um, that's common to, to all the people that, that, uh, that we work with at Build Up and, and that come to build peace, that it's this core question about what is this link in between digital technology and peace that keeps us coming back. Um, and so, I, as I said, I'm not going to offer any answers. I'm just going to offer three ways of thinking about this question. The first way of thinking about this question is to think, well, look, technology is just a tool. Okay? It's neutral. So what we need to do is we need to build more of peace technology uh, because it could be used for violence. The second way to think about it is to say, actually, no, technology is not just a tool. Technology is fundamentally changing the human experience in ways that we don't fully understand. Um, so it's more dangerous than just a tool. And the third one is to say, you know what? Whether or not technology is neutral, whether we think it's just a tool that is neutral, or whether we think that it actually creates certain conditions that make conflict more likely, is irrelevant to us as peace builders, because we have to use it anyway. Um, and we have to find ways to use it in, in a constructive way. So I'm going to try and unpack these three provocations. I just thought, thought I'd throw them at you from the beginning um, so you can start thinking um, where you stand on each of them, perhaps. So technology is just a tool. Um, in, in many ways, this has been the underlying assumption of a lot of the work that, that we've done at Build Up um, in different parts of the world. Um, and, and the idea of this is, you know, it's just a tool, um, and what matters is how you choose to use it. Um, so let me illustrate that a little bit. Um, we, um, we've uh, recently um, uh, completed and are about to repeat um, a, a program in Syria that works with local peace builders inside Syria that are using um, technology and different creat creative methods to build bridges between people inside Syria. 
And when you look at the, the, uh, the context of Syria and the way technology is affecting the conflict context, it's very clear that recruitment into armed groups via Facebook is very prevalent. Uh, that Facebook has become a tool that actually makes that recruitment much more effective. But at the same time, in the work that we were doing in Syria with local peace builders, one of the projects that came out was a very, um, very interesting project um, that uh, it was, it's called Bebisata, um, which ne means simply in, in Arabic. So Bebisata is with simplicity. And what they do is they, they make short animation films. These animation films are posted on um, Facebook. Um, and they, the, the animation film um, uh, poses a question about um, violence or non-violence, rather, so whether somebody should take up arms or not. Once um, somebody goes on the Facebook page and watches that video, they then um, get a little prompt from, uh, from, a, from a messenger bot, so for, they get a little you know, messenger window that opens up and starts a conversation with them about some of the issues that came up for the main character in that animation. Um, and prompts them to think about nonviolence, to think about the dilemma that the main character in this animation film is facing about whether or not to take up arms. So in Syria, you have Facebook being used to recruit into armed groups, and you have Facebook being used to start conversations um, about nonviolence. Technology is just a tool. What matters is how you choose to use it. We've also been doing a bunch of work in the Philippines. Um, it, I don't know how much people know about the history of the Philippines, um, but there's, a, there's, a, there's been a lot of, um, uh, a lot of, the, of the problems related to um, conflicts in, bet in between the majority Christian population and the Muslim population have to do with the way that mu the Muslim population has been portrayed, and particularly portrayed uh, in the media. Um, there's a lot of um, mainstream media in, uh, uh, in the Philippines that unfortunately portrays the Muslim po population as being extremist or um, adhering to an extremist ideology. We've been doing um, some work um, along with International Alert, which is a peace-building organization there, um, with uh, youth, um, uh, Muslim youth, to make films um, that actually reflect the reality of their experience as Muslims, as young Muslims in the Philippines, um, and show a lot of commonality and, and, uh, and a lot of links to other aspects of Filipino identity. Um, and these youth-led films are really um, their campaign to challenge perceptions using um, using media, again. So media can portray Muslims as extremists, youth-led films can challenge perceptions, technology is just a tool, what matters is how you choose to use it. In the US, uh, I mean, I'd, I hardly need to say this because everybody's very aware of what happened in the 2016 elect, uh, elections with Russian interference, um, uh, mainly via Facebook. Um, and um, so here is a, is a case where Facebook is being used essentially um, to, to distort um, a discourse and to distort an election and the, and the outcomes of an election. Uh, a few uh, months after the elections that build up, we decided that we wanted to try to see whether we could use um, some of the same tools that were being used to distort the election to actually uh, challenge polarization. So we set up a project called the Commons. Um, and what the Commons does is it finds people uh, on Twitter and on Facebook who are at risk of polarization, so who are displaying certain behaviors on social media uh, that indicate that they're only hearing one side of the debate and sends them an automated prompt. So essentially a bot contacts them with a prompt um, asking them to reconsider or to think about um, where they sit within that debate. Often it will say something like, um, do you feel like you're being heard by the other side of the debate? Um, or it might say, um, conversations in this, on this particular topic are very polarized. There were a series of prompts. If the person contacted on Twitter or on Facebook responds to that automated prompt, one of our trained facilitators would go in and continue the conversation um, to try and essentially um, talk about the way that, that uh, conversations are being polarized on social media in the US. So again, in the US, we have um, Twitter and Facebook being used uh, to distort the election. Um, we have Twitter and Facebook and semi-automated conversations being used to try to depolarize political discourse. Technology is just a tool. What matters is how you choose to use it. So that's been the core assumption behind a lot of the work that we've done. Um, and in fact, we, um, along with a number of other organizations, uh, with this core assumption in mind, we started calling this thing that we were doing to try and use technology in a more positive way we called it peace tech, and we say, 
We said this is an emerging body of peace-building practice, which includes a technologic component that is of strategic importance to its objectives. So this isn't just a peace-building organization that has a website. This is a peace-building organization or a peace-building initiative that is thinking about how technology can affect something that is core to the conflict that is being handled. Um, so in the case of Syria, that's the conversations around nonviolence. Um, in the case of the Philippines, it's uh, films that challenge perceptions. In the case of the US, it's semi-automated conversations on Twitter and Facebook. Um, all of these are things that we would call peace tech. We've even developed a bit of a typology of what does peace tech look like. So we said if we think that something is peace tech, if it strategically uses uh, technology in peace building, then what are the strategic functions of technology in peace building? Um, and we've broken it down into three categories that we see over and over in different projects. Um, the first one is data management. So any use of technology to gather, analyze, and visualize data about peace and conflict in some way. The second one is strategic communications. So any use of technology where you can engage more or different people in conversations and in stories about peace. And the third one is dialogue and mobilization. So uses of technology that create new spaces for people to connect and to organize more different actions. So if you think about the examples that I gave you from Syria, from the Philippines, from the US, they all fall into one of these strategic functions of technology for peace. Except I think over the past couple of years, we realized, you know what, this assumption about technology is just a tool and so it's neutral and what matters is how we choose to use it and so we're choosing to use it for peace and therefore that is peace tech was maybe a little naive or was not keeping in mind all of the things that were happening around us. We started to think that maybe digital technology in particular is tooling us more than we initially wanted to realize. So that's my second provocation. So I think, I think what, the, the best way to try and understand this, uh, and I'm, I'm still getting my head around it, so, so maybe we, you can help me in conversation afterwards, is to think that a technology stops being just a tool when it fundamentally alters the human experience. So let's not think about digital technologies for a second, let's think about something else, which is the clock, right? Um, when clocks were first invented and started to be used regularly, they fundamentally changed our experience of time. Before there was a clock, times were measured in other ways. They were measured according to processes, or they were measured according to tasks, or they were measured according to seasons. They weren't measured according to numbers on a dial and a regular tick-tock. The clock fundamentally changed our experience of time, and in doing so, tooled us to a certain extent, because our lives became regulated by that new technology in ways that they weren't before. Um, and I think something like that, but perhaps even stronger, is happening um, with many digital technologies. I, I, I'm saying digital technologies in general, but I always find that it's easiest to, uh, to imagine this if you think about social media. I actually think it applies to a lot of other things, but you can think about it just for social media. Um, I think digital technology is tooling us in, in three pretty fundamental ways. The first one is it's changing our incentives. Um, it's quite literally altering our brain. Uh, the kind of digital technologies that we are exposed to regularly, and particularly that people who are millennials or younger are exposed to regularly, are creating new uh, addictions to dopamine, so to, the, to, to the, the substance that is released when you get a certain kind of ping from a digital technology. They're creating an addiction based on that. Um, and there's a whole area of uh, Silicon Valley that focuses on this idea of persuasive technologies. And persuasive technologies are technologies that basically are built to give you a ping, to give you a dopamine uh, release um, at strategic moments that increase your addiction and therefore make whatever that technology is doing more persuasive. So it keeps you coming back to Facebook. It also keeps you uh, coming back to your health tracking app. It also keeps you running on your Strava app. It also keeps you, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not necessarily a negative thing, but it is certainly tooling us in a certain way. 
The second thing is digital technologies are affecting how we construct our discourse. They're affecting how we understand each other. Um, increasingly, the way that we consume uh, information, again, particularly people who are millennials, is through social media um, or through social media-like platforms. Um, and these platforms um, are built to um, optimize your engagement. And they optimize your engagement uh, by making sure that you see as much content that you agree with as possible. So the more you like something, probably everybody knows this, the more you like something, the more likely you are to be served similar content, right? So this creates filter bubbles. Outside of that which you filter through your likes and dislikes, you stop seeing other things. Um, there's a, there's a, a number of people who have, who, have called, who have talked about the idea of homophily on uh, social networks, which is this birds of a feather flock together. So essentially, the more you use a social network, the more you end up amongst people who agree or who think like you or who look like you often, who have a similar background to you. And that creates echo chambers. So you're essentially preaching to the choir and being preached back by the same choir. Um, it, it explains a lot of how um, debates like the Brexit debate or debates um, around uh, the election of Trump uh, played out. Um, so if you look at how, um, so we, we've even looked at things around LGBT rights recently um, and seen a very similar phenomenon where you have two camps who are essentially not listening to each other, are not aware that each other's reality exists. And I think because of these two things, because it's changing our incentives and it's affecting how we construct discourse, it's also altering how we build our identities. Um, some of that is very personal. Um, there's a lot of research on the fact that uh, teenagers that use um, smartphones and social media at a higher degree are more prone to depression um, and are less able um, to resolve interpersonal conflict with their friends. Um, a lot of it is also at a, at a more um, community or societal level. Uh, there's a certain amount of, of research into the fact that political polarization is increasing largely as a result of the way we can consume information through social media-like platforms. So it's changing our incentives, literally our brains. It's affecting how we construct our discourse, how we understand each other, and it's altering how we construct our identities. I think it's not just a tool. <laughs> I think it's tooling us to a large extent. And I think that's problematic, and I'm not too sure what we do with it as peace builders. So maybe my third provocation seems like a bit of a cop-out after having said all that, um, but it's where at least I'm at at the moment, which is to say that regardless of whether technology is just a tool or whether it is tooling us, regardless of whether we think it's neutral or we think it's fundamentally um, dri creating drivers of conflict, as peace builders, we have no choice but to use te digital technology, and we have to find ways, positive ways to, to use it. And that's for three reasons. The first one is out of sheer necessity. Um, I think we have a responsibility to counteract some of the negative impact of digital technology. So at Build Up, we do that with projects like the Commons, which I described earlier, which is the project in the US that tries to counteract some of the polarization on social networks um, through a very strategic intervention, sending messages that are targeted at people who are stuck in filter bubbles. So this is, we've identified a negative impact of digital technology and we're trying to counter it. The second reason we need to, start to continue using digital technology um, is because of its reach, uh, because of the possibility to access more and different people. Uh, this is the case with um, the, the project that, the example that I was giving you in the Philippines. Uh, so, you know, it would be very possible for, for uh, the Muslim youth that we were working with to just throw their hands up in the air and despair at the fact that the media portrays them as they do. But they also know that that is what creates the, the conversation around who they are that it is media that is constructing the identity that they then fall into somehow. Um, and so it's the possibility of reach, of creating films that will reach more people, that to a certain extent uh, creates a necessity for that kind of work. And then finally, I think we have to use digital technology as peace builders because it's so pervasive. Because like it or not, people are addicted to Facebook. And so even if we want to say in an ideal situation, um, we wouldn't want people to be uh, using technologies that are addictive in this way, and maybe we have a problem with it, uh, people are in fact using them, and we have to meet them where they are at. I think meeting people where they are at is actually kind of a fundamental tenet of uh, peace building, um, or at least community level peace building. 
um, you have to go to people where they're at in their conversations, in their community building, um, and in the spaces, the physical spaces where, where they gather. And I think this is no different. So we have to use digital technologies because we have to reach people where they're at. So that's kind of it. Those are the three provocations that I had. Um, again, to repeat them, the first one is just that technology is just a tool. And if you believe that, then all we need to do is just build more peace tech, because there's a lot of conflict tech. The second one is to say, actually, let's make that a little bit more problematic. Technology is not just a tool. It's also tooling us in ways that we actually don't fully understand. I gave you some of the research, but actually there's a lot of aspects of that that have not been fully researched. And so if we think that's problematic, then we need to engage not only because there are people who are using technology in a negative way, but because a lot of digital technology is creating conditions that in themselves drive conflict. And then the third one is to say, well, that's a very interesting theoretical debate. Um, but at any rate, the neutrality of technology is irrelevant because we just have to use it regardless of the, these two arguments. Um, I think at build up at the moment, we, we think about these two quite a lot. But really, this is where we're at. Where we're at is to say, what, whatever we think about whether technology is a tool or whether technology is tooling us, what we know is that we have to find more and more effective and more strategic ways to use digital technology so that we can continue to support the local peace builders that we work with. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>